congregation rises as you are able, as together we begin with the order for confession and forgiveness found in the inside front cover of your hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We sing as our gathering hymn number 660, Lift High the Cross. 660. <laughs>
communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We continue with the Kyrie and the hymn of praise. This is the Feast of Victory, beginning on page 138 and then 140 in the front of your hymn. guess about what you 
think you want to be when you are done with school? Like what you want to do for a job or career or something? You have a get? Okay, what's something you might be interested in? Psychology. Psychology, okay. So, um, could I ask you, um, would it work really well if you said, I want to be a psychologist, but I hate talking to people about their problems, so I want to be a psychologist, but never has to deal with any people or their problems. So would that, would that work? That would be hard to pull off, right? Anybody else have any guesses about what they might be interested in doing one day when you are grown up? No? What if um, I said to you, um, I would like to be a mountain climber. You know, a mountain climber who sits on a beach all day and drinks delicious beverages and never goes above sea level. A mountain climber. What might you say to me? You might say, I am missing the point of what a mountain climber is, right? Um, or if I said to you, I want to be heroic like a firefighter, you know, um, and sleep in and watch movies all day and never have to go near fire or danger or up on a ladder or hold a hose because I'm also afraid of water. Would that, would that be a, a helpful way of being a firefighter? No, you would say to me, I think you're misunderstanding what a firefighter or mountain climber is, right? There are some things, it's not just the name or the title. You do certain things. If you're a firefighter, guess what? going to be fighting fires. If you are a mountain climber, it is likely you will be around mountains. Uh, if you are a psychologist, you will be around other people. That's part of how it works, right? And whatever other things we might uh, want to be with our lives. And the reason I wanted us to be clear about this is I want to ask you, what do you think it involves to be a follower of Jesus? If we're going to follow Jesus, what kinds of things might that get us into? Yeah? Okay, certainly it will probably be involved being kind to other people, right? It's hard to say, I want to be a follower of Jesus and be a jerk to everyone. I'm sorry, that's, that's not how it works, right? That's like being a mountain climber who never wants to go above sea level. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Um, in fact, if we say to ourselves, I want to be a follower of Jesus, but I never want to have to be around other people who are hurting or suffering, and I never want to have to deal with anything unpleasant, we're kind of missing the point. In fact, we're going to hear today a story where Jesus gets his disciples, his closest friends together, and he says to them, hey, um, what do other people say about me? And they all take their guesses about what other people they've heard say people say about Jesus. And he says, well, what do you say that I am? And one of Jesus' followers, named Peter, says, You are the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Savior we've been waiting for. And Jesus goes, Great. But so that we're all clear about what that involves, I'm going to go lay down my life and die on a cross. I'm choosing to take that, all that Messiah-ness and my way of being that is to lay down my life, to love other people, to serve other people, to be kind, not even to people who are nice to me, but to stinkers, right? That Jesus' way of ruling isn't to like smash people or send in armies or conquer them, but to lay down his life for them. And then it makes it even harder, because Jesus says to his disciples, if you want to be my followers, that's the way of life we're called to as well, to put ourselves at risk for other people, to lay down our lives for other people, to look out for other people, and to walk the way of the cross. And Jesus' followers like, no, that doesn't sound fun at all. We want to be the firefighter who never has to face the fire. We want to be the mountain climber who stays on the beach all day. And Jesus goes, no, to follow me means... You're going to go where I go, do what I do. Now, the good news about following is, by definition, if you are following somebody, you're never going somewhere alone, and you're never going somewhere first. There's always the leader who's ahead of you. So even if sometimes it seems a little bit scary to go, oh my goodness, I might be sent to care for somebody else who's hurting, or to put somebody, other, somebody else's needs before my own, or to be willing to spend time with people whose hearts are broken, or to be with other people who are hurting or trying to help others, that might be scary. We're never doing it alone. If we're following Jesus, he's taking the lead. He's the first one up the ladder. Yeah, is that right? That's right, that's right, huh? Yeah. A boo boo, yeah, yeah. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we might sometimes be there to help take care of somebody else who's got a boo boo wherever it is, whether it's on their body or their hands or sometimes in their hearts, too. But we never have to do it alone. Jesus is always the one who leads us first. So, I want to ask you this week, if you'll be part of the grand adventure with me, following after Jesus as best as we can, knowing sometimes it's going to take us in new and exciting places, and sometimes it might be a little bit scary because it's, it's something that we maybe have never done before, but we're never going alone because Jesus is the one who's leading us there first. Would you pray with me right where you are, and would you all join me in prayer right where you are? Dear Jesus, we really, 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 in our best moments, want to follow after you. But we got to be honest, sometimes we want to be firefighters who never hold a hose, and sometimes we want to be mountain climbers who will only stay on the beach. And we need to trust you, 
that you're going to lead us into new places. And sometimes that means things that might seem a little bit new or scary or make us nervous, like loving other people even when it's difficult, or caring for other people who are hurting, or sharing your love with other people who are new to us. Help us to do that as we follow after Jesus, who showed us that his way of being your Messiah was to go to a cross for us and to give his life for us. Help us to trust as we follow after Jesus that you love us. We love you too. Amen. Amen. Thank you so, so much for coming up, everybody. Thanks for all your help. Our first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. Our first reading. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for today is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 9, which you can find on the left and middle column of our bulletin. I'll read the regular type, and the congregation is invited to read the bold type. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stone. I will walk in the presence of the Lord, in the land of the living. Amen. Our second reading is from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. A reading from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes mistake Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as the word of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it itself sets on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creatures can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring forth, does a, does a spring pour forth from the same opening from fresh 
and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? Or a grapevine, figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Here ends the week. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The congregation of the sea. For as long as my kids have been alive, there have been superhero movies. And not just individual superhero movies. We live in an era that for as long as my children have been around, that live in an interconnected whole, they call it a universe of interlocking, fitting superhero movies that create a whole way of seeing the world where every story fits into the next. One superhero story nudges into the next one and they all interlock like puzzle pieces. And some part of me, comic book nerd that I am, is geeking out over that. Some part of me thinks it's cool, not just for my own sake, that I can watch one superhero movie and they're going to draw pins about who the next one's going to be, the next one after that, and to know that Marvel, which knows it's a cash cow, has movies and TV shows on the drawing board for possibly the rest of my life. But also, it's kind of cool as long as this fad has been going on and my kids are getting older, that they can also be a part of this. Now, movies that were too intense for them when they were very little, they can now maybe get to see and geek out along with their nerdy dad. It's a dream at least. But, I noticed something a couple weekends ago. I took Mark to go see whatever the most recent Marvel a superhero movie was, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. The names are getting longer and longer, and the heroes are getting more and more obscure. But as I watched this movie, one part of me geeking out, thinking, hey, this is cool, now Mark and I get to have these moments of watching these movies together. And I watched this story unfold, and I thought to myself, I've seen this story before. The plot at some point becomes kind of repetitive. The, the way any of those superhero movies work, from Iron Man uh, 10 years or more ago to uh, Steve Rogers, Captain America, punching out Nazis, the Hulk smashing things, the story all basically works the same. You identify who the hero is, and a villain arises who has even more diabolical and world-destroying powers until a climax where it looks like the villain is going to destroy the city, the world, the country, whatever. And then finally, what's necessary is the hero to step up with enough firepower to smash their enemies into submission. As though basically the problem, whatever problem it is, whatever the villain is, whatever the superhero story is, basically it's going to come down to who can pound the other person better, who can blow up the other person better, who can smash or intimidate the other person better. And basically, 
one story after another. You can trade color schemes or words and stories or symbols. But whether it's Iron Man or Captain America or Black Panther or in the DC Universe, Batman and Superman, they all boil down to villain that seems very, very terrible needs punching very, very hard. And it was enough punching you can solve the problem and stop the bad guys. Of course, all the superhero movie makers know that really just sets up a sequel where you get a bigger villain needs to come on the scene, or you get a bigger problem, and we need even more firepower or more heroes to get together, or the quest for some finally super powered uh, superhero who can destroy them all and vanquish all the evil. Only when we've got any money, I guess. It occurs to me, as much as I, some nerdy part of me, is excited about new superhero movies, it also occurs to me I'm kind of tired of that storyline because it doesn't really say anything new, and I'm not really sure it's true. I'm not sure it's ever been true that what we need to face the powers of evil is just the ability to punch it or blow it up or shoot at it bigger and badder than we did before. And I say that as someone who, as much as I like those movies or those characters, knows there's an awful lot of brokenness in the world that we've been figuring out bigger and bigger ways to shoot and blow up things and punch each other, and that doesn't seem to solve the deep problem inside each one of us and all of humanity. Not only have my kids um, not known a world where there weren't superhero movies, they also haven't known a world where we weren't fighting a war. Half of my lifetime has been spent with one particular war. In my formative years, or in the late days of the Cold War, where the assumption was what we need to defeat our enemies is bigger and bigger nuclear missiles than they have, with the thought that maybe if we can threaten them that we'll blow up the world before they do, maybe that will keep them from doing it first. And it doesn't really seem like that's ever saved the day. At most, it has had this precarious, always on edge fear that you might have to go under your desk for a bomb shelter drive, uh, an emergency drill, or be afraid that something might blow up before the end of the day. My kids have never lived in a world where that wasn't always going on in the background. And for most of our lives, in terms of something like that, it's always been going on. It seems important to me to note. The stories we tell ourselves aren't just for entertainment, but at some point we become the stories that we tell. So maybe it's not surprising to me that living in a culture where most of our stories are is you need somebody with bigger and badder firepower to blow up somebody else who is a threat on the scene to become that kind of people. And maybe then I'm a little bit nervous about the fact that before my son could wear it, we had one of these masks on the house, because he wanted to be Iron Man, even before this mask was too big for him to wear, and I was the one geeking out wearing it. I don't mean to rag on our time and our place, because it seems that this is a human thing. In fact, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus is gathering momentum and followers, he has a conversation with his disciples, and it becomes pretty quickly, they've all heard the same kind of myth, the same kind of story. And what we're waiting for is someone to come along with big enough firepower to stop whatever the buildings are, the ominous them out there. What we need is just someone who's powerful enough to smash or destroy or crush them. When Jesus asks his disciples, well, what, what, what do you say about me? Peter's answer, although right, brings a big, big asterisk. Peter goes, you're the Messiah. But everything Peter has heard, all the storytelling he's heard all his life, and for generations before him, Mark, what this Messiah figure is going to be is basically a first century Avenger, basically sort of a Captain Israel instead of a Captain America. Someone who will defeat our enemies by raising up an army or commanding angels to come and zap our enemies and will crush them and destroy them. That's what the world needs, is when there's an enemy that's oppressing us, what we need is God to send a superhero who either with laser beams shooting out of his eyes or angels at his disposal or raising us up to fight him back. That's what we need, is someone who will crush our enemies that way. And for generations, the people of Israel and Judah have been telling that kind of story. When God finally sends Messiah, we'll know it because he'll be like a superhero, because he'll be like a, a, a divinely appointed help who will just smash whatever the empires are of the day. And they have lived through one empire after another, from the Babylonians and the Assyrians to the Greeks and the Medes and the Persians to the Romans in Jesus' day. It seemed this unending, like, like a, a, a league of doom, like in the superhero movies. One empire after another, conquering them. And the hope became, the assumption became, what we need, obviously, is somebody who will raise up an army to fight off those enemy invaders and destroy our enemies. That must be the way God saves the day. It's the same myth of redemptive violence that my kids get excited about and I geek out about as well. 
So Peter goes, yeah, you're the Messiah. And I'm ready, if you're, if you're telling us, Jesus, that if this is our time to call the arms, okay, we're ready. Or are you just going to fight with angel soldiers? And Jesus immediately goes, that's not what the word means. It's, it's like that famous scene in the movie Princess Bride where the guy keeps saying inconceivable, and one person has to say, you keep using that word. I, I don't think it means what you think it means. That to be the Messiah, Jesus says, isn't about God raising up an army and smashing or blowing anything. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. God's way of saving the world isn't I need to punch something into submission, but I'll break the power of evil by absorbing the worst it can do and break it open from the inside by absorbing it in the way of suffering, love, and self-giving that we call the way of the cross. In fact, Jesus, the moment Peter says, you're the Messiah, Jesus stops even using that language because it's, you can't help but hear it in that sort of superhero, avenger kind of a way. So Jesus stops talking about being the Messiah and says, okay, I'm going to use a term that's not quite so loaded, that you don't already have these preconceptions about I'm the Son of Man. Oh, well, I don't know what that, what that type of thing. So Jesus tells them, my way of doing what God has brought me to do, my way of bringing the kingdom of God, the reign of God, is to give myself away, laying down my life in suffering love. This is how God saves the world. This is how God redeems the world. And to be very honest, what shocks the disciples is it doesn't fit the story they've been telling themselves or that it had been handed on to them for generations before. For it doesn't fit the stories and the assumptions they've been telling for so long. Jesus says God's way of saving the world isn't to raise up a, a, an army or a, a legion of angels to zap people or to smash down an empire. God's way of saving the world is suffering love that lays down its life even for the sinners who are labeled the enemy. That changes things. Because if you and I are going to be followers of this Jesus, if you and I are going to be followers of this Christ, you know, Christian, the people who follow Christ, we're called to a different way of being present in the world. And the world around us is only used to telling stories that go something like this, where what we need is somebody to have enough firepower, and then they put on the suit, and they fight the bad guys like this. That's classic. And maybe what Jesus does is exposes how childish and silly this was all along, and more to the point that it was never God's way of solving things. Some young childish part of me still geeks out about whatever cool comic book suit your movie is in theaters or toy is available or a story I can pass along to my kids. But also some part of me knows they need to know there's an alternative story. And that God's story all along has not been one of let's smash the thing that we're afraid of, but instead God's way of laying down God's own life at the cross, even for the powers that seem most opposed to. God. That's God's surprising, upside-down way of saving the world. And if you and I are going to be followers of Jesus, we, learn, we need to learn how to tell an upside-down sounding story that God's way of saving the world looks <coughs> like to untrained eyes, like defeat, looks like loss, looks like death, looks like a cross in a world that is used to stories where who's the latest superpower and hero to smash whatever the latest villain is. It's a matter of retelling new kinds of Stories and letting our lives be shaped by a cross and resurrection rather than who's the biggest firepower around. I want to suggest here's an alternative kind of story we need to be able to tell. When I think about the, the milestones and the landmarks folks have been sharing in the last 20 years, yesterday as we marked 20 years since September 11, 2001, it occurred to me what is heroic and powerful about the story of Flight 93 the folks who commandeered the plane that crashed in Shanksville, is their willingness to see their power was in self-giving. Their power was in sacrifice. They, they, they didn't have the ability to stop other planes that were inside, but they could stop what was going to be used in the flight they were on from killing other people, even though it meant laying down their lives for the passengers who were willing to offer up their lives so that somebody else could be spared, somebody else could be protected. They understood that was the victory they were going to achieve. I want to suggest our lives are going to be marked by telling those kinds of stories to show the way that self-giving love becomes the way that the world changes, become the way that evil gets defeated. Because as soon as we give in to the idea that what we need to fight evil is more punching, that only sets off the people we hit into more punching and a never-ending cycle. That has never ever been able to fix anything. But what Jesus offers us, what we maybe got a glimpse of in the story of Flight 93, was an alternative kind of story. The way self-giving love changes things by taking the worst that evil can do, and saying, I'm not going to play by those rules, 
I will take the worst you can do and lay down my life in suffering love to break open the power of evil. This is the power we call the way of the cross. And we are called to that kind of life in the midst of a world that thinks that looks foolish and nonsensical and says it looks like weakness or it looks like you're a loser. We're called to be the kind of people who are willing to practice compassion even to people who have been jerks to us. We're called to be the kind of people who will go out of our, our way for the sake of other people, even if it's inconvenient, it's difficult, or slightly uncomfortable. We're called to be the kind of people who love even people who are really, really difficult to love. We're called to be the kind of people who see conversation as a way to learn from other people rather than to yell at people or beat them up with our words. We're going to be different in the world because of that. But the world is aching for a new kind of story. The folks who make comic book superhero movies, as far as I can tell, are going to keep cranking out stories like this because it continues to be profitable to do that. But I suspect people are beginning to get tired of the same old cliché story of somebody in a new colored suit blowing something up. And you and I are sent to be people who tell and who live a different kind of story. And it sounds scandalous sometimes, the same way it sounds scandalous even to Simon Peter, who can't believe, who can't imagine a Messiah, a Captain Israel, whose way of saving is to die rather than to blow somebody up. But the world is aching for that kind of message that is both good and new. How this week will you and I be people who embody a different kind of a story for a world that is tired of saying cliches like this? Where will the newness happen? Thank you. Amen. The congregation rises as you are able, as we sing our King of the Day. Number 798, will you come and follow me?
confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you can find on the inside front cover of your hymn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. Each part of our prayers today ends with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond to your offering. Gracious God, you who reign over all places and all creation, first we give you praise and thanks on this day for the gift of this life, for the gift of one another, for the gift of a beautiful world and of your creation. And we ask that you would help us not only to be appreciative and grateful, but to be good stewards of all that you have created, that we might share with one another and for one another all your goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray, O oh God, that you would stir up your spirit among us in the church, that we would be faithful followers of Jesus who walk the way of Jesus, the path of self-giving love in the face of a world that thinks it looks nonsensical or weak or foolish. Give us the courage of Jesus to love others. Give us the courage of Jesus to lay down our lives. Give us the courage of Jesus to stand with those who are suffering, to offer compassion and help for those who mourn, and to find ourselves on the margins with those most in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, too, in this new fall season, that you would bless students and teachers and administrators in schools, that you would be with all those in harvest who are working to produce enough food for all people. We pray that you would be with us in our routines, in the returning of fall activities and Sunday school, that you would help us be faithful and keep us grounded in your word. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, O oh God, for those in our lives who we know with celebrations and with sorrows, for those who are sick in body, mind, and spirit, those welcoming new transitions and new members of their families. We lift up to you especially John, Yvonne, Barb, Bev, Missy, Jason, Emery, Dwight, Mrs. Spider, those we speak out loud in our, or name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your promise of gathering, of resurrection, and of your victory over the powers of death. As we mark 20 years since September 11, 2001, in this place, we give you thanks for your promise to bring light out of darkness. We ask for comfort for all those who grieve and whose lives have been affected since those days. And we ask that you would gather us up with all your saints of all times and places in your resurrection feast which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All these prayers, Lord God, and what else you see that we need, we ask boldly in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. You're invited to share a sign of Christ's peace.
great Thanksgiving we're going to have on the inside back of our <laughs> Thank you. 